How are you guys doing today? All good? good. All right, awesome, cool. All right, so I'll just be asking you a bunch of questions. I'm sure you're here because you want to find out whether this whole startup thing, if you want to actually want to get into the whole mobile gaming or even casual gaming business, whether it's good or not. Well, that's what we're here to find out. So I'll just get the ball rolling. So uh, our good friend there, Errol, already did the introduction, so that's cool. So I don't need to do any comedic spin or whatnot. So we can just get on to the nitty gritty. So what do you say, guys? All good? Yeah, yeah let's do yeah. it. <laughs> All right, sweet, sweet. Yeah, the mic works, don't worry. All right, cool. Uh -huh. So let's just go here. All right, so maybe there's something a little fluffy, like um, since you guys are all in the games business, be it for the sales side or even the production side or even like the whole networking side, what kind of things do you do like during your, like, you know, your free time? What kind of games do you play? Like, maybe you'll keep the answer short because you don't have that much time. <laughs> so we'll start with uh, Anton, of apart course. From uh, apart from my own games? Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> well, Brave Frontier, right? Brave Frontier, yeah. yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Brave Frontier, yes, yes. yes uh, <laughs> Well, you know, uh, oh, I play a game that's called Make It Rain. It's not its not even a game. Anybody here know Make It Rain? Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 there yeah. you go. That one, two persons. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so that's a, uh, it's kind of a funny game where you just swipe for money. And you the more you swipe, the more you have more money. That's all. You know. it, feel, it feels pretty zen, actually. <laughs> I did play a bit of like Disco Zoo, like back in the, like actually up to now, actually. Yeah. That's very zen, like Tiny Tower, it's really such a yes, sick yes. thing. So Kunimitsu san, yep. yes. So today, the reason why I came here is, you know, my company, you know, used to, like, you know, a year ago, we are struggling mm -hmm. because, you know, greed is like this, right? <sighs> right and right. the native game is coming up, right? And then last January, we lost like, you know, a monthly, it's, you know, three million. Mm -hmm. But now it's, you know, really come back. And then really the positive. And then we almost, you know, finish fundraising. And then we make, you know, Gumi Venture 2. That's also, you know, established, right? So what I want to say is, you know, somebody want to invest, you know, just, you know, come us or, you know, here is, you know, our CEO, uh, Singapore CEO, David. So somebody want to invest, just, you know, come to, come to visit us, you know. We have a money, we have a know-how, we have, you know, how to make success? Oh, of course, of course. Right. But, the question, but the real <laughs> question is, like, what do you do during it? Like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> like, yes, anything game, that you play recently? Oh, yeah, game of... is, you know, uh, so of course, you know, I have to, you know, research, you know, other companies, you know, competitors game, right? Mm. So <laughs> every day, every weekend is, you know, I keep playing, like, you know, top chat game. So currently is, you know, uh, like, you know, game of war. I don't know what is a good, but you know, their sales is good, right? Uh, so I play right, game right. of war, you know, a lot. And then also Chinese game, Dauta Chuan Chi. Now Chinese number one game, right? The game is, you know, actually very good. So yeah, what I play is, you know, only for the business and, you know, every country is, you know, top, you know, grossing game. Yeah, like that. All right. So, uh, Stefan. How about you? Like, what do you do? I as well love Brave Frontier. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Let's sure. go it's for it. This one's my my client, not just because of that. Um, so I've been playing a lot of Brave Frontier uh, on the match three front. I've been playing Puzzles and Dragons from Gong Ho, and then one of the games that I've been playing quite a bit um, is Hello Hero um, from FinCon. Oh, uh, it's right, a Korean-based right. developer and publisher. Reason why I love it is they've kind of cross-platform published on Facebook, so I can play it on mobile, on Canvas, you know, on the bus to work. Uh, at home, so um, it's just everywhere I, I want to be. Uh, it's really convenient. And, do you feel that most games they do this more often, or do you, I mean the whole cross-platform thing? In your opinion, you know, personally speaking, um, cross-platform publishing uh, is the most effective way to build games on Facebook. Um, we can get to, into a more of a technical discussion later. No, oh, yeah, of course, but, of but course. What we, fa what we found is that um, people that play games. Um, on Facebook that have integrated like ported mobile to canvas or canvas to mobile um, We see quite a bit more engagement on mobile. So about 2.3 X uh, on canvas about 1.5 X and then even monetization So when we think about payment volume about 3.3 X um, So it just it brings the experience to wherever you are So if you're at work you have a few minutes in between meetings you can play it on canvas if you're at home um, on the couch watching TV, you can play it on tablet, and then when you're commuting to work, you can play it on the phone. All right, so Hugo, uh, Hughes, I, I, I prefer to call you Hugo because it's much shorter, and you told That's me to easier. call you that. Yeah. So something interesting that was just mentioned is uh, capturing people's time, right? We only have 24 hours in a day, so I've been playing games like Candy Crush or Clash of Clans, a lot of Clash of Clans, because it's just a very short time. Mm -hmm. So Ubisoft is learning uh, to do that, and I highly recommend a game you might have played, which is uh, Trials, Trials Frontier. Oh, Trials Frontier, yes. Anybody yes. played that? 
It's a no, cool no racing issue. game. Like very very tough, <laughs> by and, the way. And recently, we also uh, investigated on another way to think. So we we, we develop AAA high end games for consoles, and we are developing companion apps. So a very good test was our recent uh, Assassin's Creed um, Black Flag companion app, where basically you were managing your pirate fleet with your mobile when you're not playing uh, so asynchronously, basically, and when you're not in front of your TV. And I think Watch Dogs even mastered that even more with a lot of asynchronous uh, gameplays, and, uh, and it's really inventing, innovating in that, in that uh, time. How do you use the time of the gamers? Oh, by the way, congrats on Watch Dogs. Apparently, the game sold like four million on its first week. Oh. First five days. <laughs> That's nice. Awesome. awesome. Oh yeah, they, you, I believe you're also working on uh, Unity, right? The French one, uh, Assassin's Creed Unity, should That's be coming correct. out like soon, October, right? That's Ish. correct. We had a huge announcement uh, yesterday, so it's uh, live from Los Angeles, and uh, the the visuals are spectacular, and the, so far the reception has been phenomenal. Ah, uh, cool. So revise. So anything that you play slightly in your free time, either for work or for play. Yes, I actually I'm playing on both, basically as a casual on the mobile. On the mobile game, actually, uh, I play uh, Boom Beats uh, from Supercell, and also play the latest one, the uh, uh, from the game from Kings, the the latest one, the the, the witch, the jewel witch, the yeah. one that's yeah. uh, bubble witch, bubble right witch, too. Yeah. Right, yeah. that's that's the one that I'm playing. But I'm also playing a lot of game on the PC. And currently, actually, I'm playing a Watchdog, which is from Ubisoft. It's mm -hmm. a very interesting game. It has uh, a lot of a different type of gameplay. And it's, uh, if you're a hardcore gamer on the PC, you should check that out. I also play another type of game like Titanfall. Uh, Blizzard also have a very interesting game called the Hearthstone that people can play both on the uh, iPad and also on the, on the PC, on the Mac and the, uh, and the PC. Yeah. yeah. I do believe Hearthstone definitely. It, it's like one of those core companies that actually just tap into the casual market and is doing pretty well at the moment so far. So let's just go back to that. Uh, let's just go to that one question I kind of wanted to ask. Like, how has mobile gaming changed since the past few years? And how has it changed the game industry? Like, we'll start with you, Revi, from your uh, yeah, well, um, experience. Well, mobile game actually has been grow tremendously and becoming like a mainstream. Um, I think last time mobile game that's really uh, well developed is in Japan market with uh, Dokomo. So I think with the uh, emerging of uh, iOS and Android platform, uh, mobile games becoming like a uh, mainstream. A lot of my friends who never really play game, now they start playing game, and a lot of them actually start become a uh, hardcore games. Games like uh, Clash of Clans, like uh, uh, Boom Beats, uh, actually is considered like uh, for hardcore gamer. But many of the players actually are uh, people who never know about the, the, the game or they don't play game. So yeah, it's been like a huge market, and I think it's the fastest growing segment uh, in the whole industry. And actually, for like MOL, also this currently is the fastest growing uh, segment within MOL payment, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, Hugo, like to add on to that, or you got your own thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back. Of course, there's a huge growth and a huge potential. I think we're just scratching the surface here. Um, I just talked about these companion applications. We see a lot of innovation as well with just very simple uh, gameplay mechanics. Um, and, and sometimes going back to the roots and what the indies are doing, it, it's uh, as, a, as a game maker, a more AAA, it, it's, uh, it's very intriguing because we've going back to very simple mechanics uh, works. All right, all right. So, of course, uh, Stefan, maybe yep. you have more to add considering that you have a lot of free-to-play stuff coming your way. We have a few mobile users at Facebook, okay. yeah, sure. Okay, mobile <laughs> too, mobile too, yes. So um, we, we believe at Facebook that um, mobile has revolutionized the gaming industry. Um, it's revolutionized our own business. We've even invented ourselves. Facebook was originally a desktop business. Um, now 59% of our revenue comes from mobile. Two years ago, we couldn't even monetize mobile. So this is happening all through the news feed. If you look at Google Play, the App Store, they've both got over a million apps in each one. Um, our mobile app install ad product um, drove 350 million downloads of game apps um, since 2013. So obviously, um, the the alignment of where the industry is going, right? So mobile and social uh, is also where Facebook is going. So we're really passionate about game development on Facebook. All right, uh, Kunimitsu san. Yep. Yeah. So I think so, you know, in 10 years, the, the market is you know changing so fast, right? Yes. And then many companies, you know, come up and then die, come up, die, you know, like this, right? And they, especially in Japan, they have, you know, so many changes. Uh, like our company, we are first start from Mixi, PC game. Uh, maybe you know Mixi, maybe you don't know. 
but yeah, we make you know PC uh, social game, and then later is you know shifting to feature phone social game, and then later is you know smartphone browser based social game, and then later shifting on native mobile game, right? Yep. And then at the start is you know really casual type of the mobile game. Now it's you know going to be micro, right? So I think you know the market is you know changing so fast, and yeah, all the time you know the player is you know changing, right? So I think you know in here, if you know somebody making the game, I don't prefer, I, I don't recommend, like you know making uh, mobile micro game, this place, and then mobile casual game. Here is you know too crowded. So if you know I were you guys, maybe you know making only for the tablet. And then, of course, you know, smart TV with uh, free-to-play game is, you know, coming soon, right? So I think, you know, next step is, you know, tablet. And then next, next step is, you know, uh, smart TV with free-to-play, with controller. And then next is, you know, tab, uh, Oculus. Oh, yeah, Oculus. That's, you so know, of course, it's coming, right? Yeah. yeah, so if, you know, I was a startup, you know, I'm not making, you know, now trend, like, you know, smartphone casual game or, you know, smartphone micro game. Rather go to you know those new area, so I think you know uh, the mobile game market is changing, but you know all the time is you know growing, right? Mm. And then, yeah, from now it's you know yeah of course you know changing you know more. Oh, for those who aren't really aware what the Oculus Rift is, it's like this VR headset thing you can play games in like the whole VR form. It's really cool. That's great, right? Yeah. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Very, very so cool. if you know here you know yeah now. haven't you know yeah. try you know should be try right. Yeah. Oh, you guys bought it. Yeah, oh, yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. to be honest, I, you know, it's, it's a phenomenal experience. Uh, I'm not an expert in the area. Uh, it does not change our mission as a company. Our mission as a company is to make the world more open and connected. It's, it was an interesting social, uh, potential social platform that um, Zuckerberg was very interested in acquiring. Um, you know, we think that, you know, mobile is the here and now. Mm -hmm. So moving from a mobile first company, we're a mobile best company. That's where we position ourselves. And then Oculus is that kind of next big thing. So. Yeah. Uh, what can you do? I mean, you, I mean, you won't know until you try new things, right? In the end. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, Anton, would you like to add on to more like uh, why do you think? Uh, what do you think? How much has it changed the game industry? I'm sure, uh, the mobile gaming side. Sure. I mean, you know, the word gaming itself, uh, from what I used to know, and now is really completely changed. I came from not a very uh, well-to-do family, so I don't have a console in my home. So it used to be, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, you go to your friend's house and then you play. You have to back him, hey, can I go to your house and play whatever, your Sega, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's what I know about gaming, you know. It's that you have to knock your people door and, and to, to like, uh, you know, bother them and, and, and play with them, you know. The community but, aspect. Yeah, or sometimes just watch them play because uh, they already have a player too. So <laughs> that's, that's how gaming was for me. But nowadays, it's, you know, uh, it's just giving hope for people, uh, you know, people who, who don't have console, who don't even play games like Revi mentioned. It's now can, you, you can play games at, at uh, your fingertips. And I think most of you also play games in, uh, in, the, in the toilet, right? Bathroom, which is like mm. disgusting and <laughs> yes, <laughs> supposed yes. to be unhygienic, but you do. Uh, and you know, that's, that's how I think the industry has changed. All right. Uh, just a bit of a PSA. Please wash your hands after you're done tapping your phones <laughs> in the toilet, please. Okay, because you know, I have shadow phones and stuff. Anyway, uh, let's also go to this other question. Like, um, why do you think free to play? I mean, in the West, people are kind of receptive about it for some strange reason, but somehow Asia, Southeast Asia, they're just fine with it. I mean, with all the games like Ragnarok Online, up till now, uh, what's that Candy Crush, all that, they're fine with this model. Like, why do you think the Asian, Asia has adopted this model, like, very well, like, very, very heavily? We'll start with you, Anton. Sure, I, just a quick comment. I mean, as a, as a user point of view, uh, growing up in Indonesia, and you know, I'm pretty much in Southeast Asia uh, uh, all, all my life, is that people, I think, they like to try f free samples. And that is why I think, uh, rather than you put a high price on a game, if you want to do so, uh, something in Southeast Asia, you just let them play for free until a certain time when they love the game, I think they will pay. Mm. So I think that's, you know, to answer your question quickly is, you know, why, Southeast Asian in general are more receptive because that's how we are built, uh, uh, you know, being brought up. All oh, right, right. So Kunimitsu, how about in your own opinion, why do you think this model is very popular <laughs> in the region? That's because of the piracy, right? Oh, yeah, piracy, so piracy. Like, you know, yes. yeah, China or, you know, Southeast Asia, there is, you know, so many piracy issue, right? So if, you know, consumer game is, you know, just, you know, piracy, then no business is going, right? 
But, you know, free to play is, you know, that's very tough to pirates, right? That's, you know, one of the reasons. And then the other reason is, you know, uh, free to play is, you know, more like a service, right? So consumer game, package game is, you know, just launch and then finish. But, you know, a free to play game is, you know, always we just, you know, watching the user, listen to the user, and then we changing the content, right? So that's, you know, makes, you know, game better and better, right? So I think, you know, those two reasons. All right. Um, actually, uh, funny thing you brought up piracy, because I would like to actually ask uh, Hugo about this, like your thoughts, like because console gaming has faced a lot of piracy as of late. I mean, not as of late, like even way back then, like has it changed that much in Ubisoft's opinion? And, and I know you guys have this whole DRM system that's worked out, which kind of half favorable and half not so much favorable, but how do you think it has changed much since then? So uh, parity is still a challenge. Uh, it, we take it as an opportunity. We, we used to try to fight it a lot with the RMs and so on. And what we learned is that service is, more, is very important. We talked about reacting to what people want. Mm -hmm. If your service is a, is a long-term engagement, uh, people will tend to play the, the official version if you offer them uh, you know, continuously a relationship. Um, what is interesting is that even people who parrot our games usually are fans, and, and eventually they'll come to us. Yeah. So we need to find ways to engage them directly. Um, countless of people, when you travel in the region, have played the, the Ubisoft games. I, I don't think they, they would be able to afford playing Watch Dogs on a PS4. Mm -hmm. um, and, but if there is a way that we can engage them, either through a free-to-play uh, companion application, or if they run into it in an internet cafe, or another type of experience, then suddenly now we have a connection, and up to us to develop that relationship with a service. So um, we learned tremendously from how the industry in Asia uh, was born and grew with the internet cafes, the service, uh, the, the free-to-play business model, the, the how to access uh, payment. Uh, you know, payment is also an issue. People don't have a credit card. Of course. So when, when you combine all this, um, it's actually helping us to reach even an audience in Western countries that we used to not reach. Uh, and there's Eastern Europe, there's South America, so uh, it's, open up, it's opening up a lot of doors and a lot of eyes worldwide for Western publishers. All right, uh, we'll have to go back to Stefan because we kind of skipped, so ap apologies for that. No, so, no problem. Uh, no like problem, okay. Yeah. So we'll go back to that last question I mentioned. Like, Why do you think free-to-play trends really high in Asia compared to the West? Yeah, so uh, the freemium model, I, I think about two things. Uh, one, I think about market expansion, right? So going back to you know, legacy, console, um, freemium has just opened up much broader audience of customers, right? We know that it's probably like, you know, opened up the demographic age range for about 20 years, right? Probably younger and also older, right, from that core console audience. Um, number two, I think about um, quality of experience, right? So things like long-term value, um, or lifetime value, rather. Um, so I'll tell you a, an anecdote of um, one of the first meetings I had when I joined Facebook about four years ago. I was meeting with a large uh, hardware manufacturer in Singapore, and uh, a marketing client came up to me and said, can you please help me get to 10,000 fans by the end of the quarter? I said, well, why do you want to get to 10,000 fans? He says, oh, I won't get my annual bonus if I don't get to 10,000 fans, right? Wow. So, that, so it was a little bit scary, right? Because um, 10,000 was a good number at that point in time four years ago for Facebook. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about the quality of the user, right? So going back to Hugo's point, same for gaming, right? Uh, it's not just about the download. Uh, so when we work on user acquisition campaigns, um, it's not just about racking up the numbers. We want to get the quality of the user um, so we can get a longer lifetime value, and then it's about monetizing the game, right? Most games are getting maybe 2 3% of their users monetizing. We want to get that number higher, uh, and we feel we can do that through things like Facebook targeting tools. Uh, okay, cool, cool. Uh, Revi, would you like to add in, or you got your sure. own opinions um, on that? I think about the free-to-play, right? You're talking about free-to-play. Yep, yep. Well, you can say that the first uh, English game free-to-play actually started here in Southeast Asia. I think not many people are actually realizing that um, and we actually started the business way back in the early 2000s and actually we are catering the payment for the free-to-play game. And MOL, when we started, it used to be the publisher of a free-to-play game, but we before them to become the payment. And um, basically there's a, a, a three big company that uh, in Southeast Asia in the uh, MMORPG publisher. 
uh, they were Asia soft, started in Thailand, they, they published Ragnarok, in Indonesia is Lito, and in Philippines is a, a, a level up with a all Ragnarok game. So they become a very successful company uh, as, a, as a MMO publisher and they all started with a free to play game. So the free to play game has been happening here in Southeast Asia for like years, in the early 2000s. I just shared my experience that actually um, when I joined MOL in 2009, I went to GTC uh, in San Francisco. And all the panel, the discussion is all very exciting about discussing about free to play, which at the time is uh, on the Facebook. But I was like kind of puzzled. Why so excited about it? And so it's Asia already started like way back in the early 2000, 2003. So I think it's like uh, the free to play models becoming like a, becoming like a global uh, with the emergence of the Facebook game because all the early Facebook uh, 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 successful fa Facebook game publisher like a Zinger, like a Playdom, Playface is all adopt a free to play model. And after that, it's just become a viral. And all the mobile game also actually it it, it also evolved. It started uh, from the paper download. But these days, if you go to like app any, the majority of the game that monetize all free to play model. Ah, oh, right, yeah. right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, so, uh, like to also find out from you guys, like, is it for every startup out there who's thinking of maybe just jumping into the whole gaming uh, developer and all that? They got their own producers. They they got their own developers and coders and whatnot. Do you think it's viable for gaming startups to just start up shop in um, Southeast Asia? If so, which country in Southeast Asia would be the best to start? We'll start with you, Revi. Okay, um, I think it's, we can, uh, it's a development, basically, if you want to, uh, uh, has the development office, uh, support development office, uh, I think Vietnam and Indonesia is a, a very good the way I see it. Because I think you can take a look at uh, some of the uh, mobile game app store, I mean on the mobile game app store, the one that's very popular, the, the big hit of course, there's uh, Flappy Bird, which is Devlo in Vietnam. And of course in Indonesia, Anton is very, actually very successful, and Indonesia has a lot of talent also. And in terms of like operational cost, if you need to hire a lot of developer, I think Vietnam and Indonesia actually is a, a low cost to do the development. Uh, but in, in terms of like a networking, all the Singapore of course is a good place, and it's a, a lot of pe people who visited uh, this region. They usually they come to Singapore basically uh, to have a meeting here. Yeah. Uh, Hugo, maybe you got something to add. I see you very agitated to the mic. <laughs> Sure. Uh, we've had a tremendous success being in Singapore. Uh, Ubisoft Singapore is now five years old and uh, grew from uh, you know one employee, Olivier, to uh, 280 uh, roughly at the moment. And the government's been supportive. We have good relationships with schools, uh, with DigiPen as well. Um, and uh, I'm dreaming about a very vibrant community, right? I would love if this area could be the Silicon Valley for um, entertainment, for digital uh, games, and, and so on. Um, it has the potential. We have, we have very good people across the region, good schools, a lot of creativity, uh, excellent artists from the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, and we need to stay competitive, so uh, Sing the Singapore uh, you know, needs to keep investing in, uh, in this sector uh, because it's vibrant, it's just the beginning. And we planted a few seeds, and I think now it's time to, to grow the trees. But I feel that Singapore, I mean, not only is a small island, it's also actually pretty expensive to live in. So wouldn't that sort of hamper, like some developers would come down and they earn this much, and they might not even have the upkeep to stay around for rent and all that? I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Well, definitely, uh, as I just mentioned, Singapore needs to remain attractive. Yeah, one it is of the attractive. Reason, no, no, no questions about that. One of the reasons is, is because of the cost, the yeah. high costs. And I think when when we recruit uh, a lot of people from Southeast Asia, they are actually quite um, uh, passionate about coming. Uh, first, because of that dynamic, and uh, it's uh, we have 32 nationalities in the studio, mm -hmm. so just that in itself. Uh, creates amazing opportunities. Of course, everybody speaks in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We work with studios worldwide, in particular with Montreal and the Canadian teams. And a lot of people uh, join Ubisoft as a maybe as a gate to one day move to to Europe or to or to North America. Um, and I think that's what people need to have in mind when you enter the game business. It's a global business. If you're successful in Southeast Asia, there's a high chance you would be successful in Brazil or in Eastern Europe, because the markets are similar. And, um, and it's just starting small, but thinking big. Yeah, right, right. yeah absolutely. So just to, to add, on, add on to that, um, one, agree with uh, Rivai around 
um, Vietnam and Indonesia. I uh, would also add Thailand in there. Okay, okay. Um, about two and a half weeks ago during Casual Connect, we held an event uh, at the Facebook Singapore office. Uh, I was a developer and publisher round robin. We had uh, invited uh, small game developers, maybe three or four people, um, to pitch their game ideas to large Chinese publishers. So Tencent, um, uh, six, waves. six Waves. Now, yeah. one of the things that um, we love to do at Facebook is connect indie developers with big time publishers, right? So Southeast Asia, yes, we believe it's a hotbed for game innovation, but to Hugo's point, um, you don't need to just publish in Southeast Asia. You can publish globally, right? And that's part of what my team's responsibility is, right? So after that connection is made, we can work with uh, producers, we can work with developers, we work with publishers, we connect those indie developers to publishers, and we take those games globally. So um, we love to see that. It's not just about the big players, it's about the small guys, too. Oh, right, right. Kunimitsu, maybe in your opinion, apart from Japan, yeah. where else in Asia or even Southeast Asia region would would, would a startup have to do to actually make it big or maybe grow big? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, definitely, you know, making the studio in here is important because uh, Southeast Asia, already the market is, you know, big. So our sales from Southeast Asia alone is already over the two million. That's good, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, so now market is already big. And then, of course, you know, in the few years, you know, going to bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So now the market is now already big. And then in the few years, you know, going to bigger. And then the competition is, you know, not that hard. So there is no reason to open the studio in here, right? And then I think, you know, if the open studio in Southeast Asia, headquarter, only the choice is here, right? And then uh, what I found is uh, Southeast Asia, there is, you know, so many talent. Like, you know, Indonesia have, you know, so many good artists. And then Vietnam have, you know, so many good, like, you know, engineer. And then Philippines have, you know, so many good, you know, customer support or server engineer or, you know, every place have, you know, good point or weak point, right? So I think uh, for the Southeast Asia strategies, you know, headquarters is here and then using other, you know, uh, countries, like, you know, good point together. That's, you know, very works. And then compare with Japan, Japan is, uh, very good for like craft wise mm -hmm. uh, making you know with you know few people and you know creating like you know original content is very strong but what's bad for is you know like uh, systematic operation is you know too weak Japanese people is you know tend to uh, uh, everything is you know doing by myself or like this right but in the near future like uh, production cost and you know time is you know bigger and bigger right so those one, uh, I don't think, you know, Japan people can handle that. So always, you know, I was surprised, you know, David team is, you know, doing the systematic job is, you know, way better than Japan. Yeah, so that's, you know, another good part from here. Uh, Anton, I have a feeling you're probably going to say Indonesia. No, actually, it depends on, on, you know, the capital of the company. If you are bootstrapping, how many people you have, what kind of games you're making, you know, when you start uh, case by case, I would say. Uh, my opinion will be from from my, my my own because what I did was actually I set up a company in Singapore uh, because that's uh, the easiest you know I think you can file it online and get it done with 20 minutes or something in Indonesia if you if I'm not trying to badmart my own government but if you want to do a, a business there it takes like months and you know something like that so compared to Singapore it's is the best option I think uh, but having said that my operation uh, unless you have unlimited money, like uh, of, of course, <laughs> of course, you, you, you can then go to Philippine, blah blah blah, like what he said. But a uh, company like us, uh, you know, I try to stay where we are. So if you guys are starting up uh, bootstrapping, stay where you are. If you're in Thailand, stay in Thailand. Just set up a, a an entity in Singapore and do do it wherever you are. Because I think gaming is quite flexible as long as you find the, the right talent. So that's what we did. So we have an entity that owns 100%. Of a, a company in Indonesia. Okay, one last question before we go to the whole uh, community panel. Like, what are the top mobile gaming or even free to play trends that every developer, every startup should look out for to maybe hook on in the future? We'll start with you, Anton, since you're closer. <laughs> hook, hook on, on. Uh, basically, like uh, to keep watch for for 2014 and 2015. Oh. In the, in the gaming, right? Yeah, uh, in trend. gaming, yes, the trends. Uh, a lot of acquisition is, is happening, I think, uh, because 
the only I believe the only way uh, bigger publishers can actually uh, grow is to acquire. Uh, that that is one thing for sure. Another thing that I think is not a it's not a new trend. It's already been uh, going on. Is is the way uh, platforms such as Kickstarter is helping indies to raise fund, and you know they they don't even have to have a team. They don't even have to have anybody on a payroll. They just need the concept, and if people like it. They they, they you know they, they put their money, and you can get your team there from that money, that funding. So. It's not new, but I think it's it's gonna be something to something that's very long lasting and not gonna go away anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So Kunimitsu, any trends apart from what he said that you know that you should keep 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 watch for in gaming in 2014 and 15? Right. So mobile mitoka game battle in Japan and US or you know Western countries you know almost over because you know now uh, development cost and time. Like, you know, when we are making for the GUI, that time the cost is, you know, less than half million. But, like, you know, Blade Frontier, that kind of the size is, you know, one million to two million. Yeah. But now we are making, is, you know, ha, two million to three million, the development cost. And then also, you know, marketing fee is, you know, ha, few million at least. So, I think, you know, those areas is, you know, already crowded, right? Except shooter. Uh, shooters. Yeah. Yes. So Western country, you know, shooter is you know big genre, right? But you know there is no deer hunter is okay, but of course you know there is you know so many spaces, right? So yeah, if I were you guys, you know, I try to shoot uh, any first person, third person. So here you know still have a spaces, but yeah, in the future, in the near future, this year of course you know uh, mobile market shifting to the tablet. And the next year, I think, you know, tablet market is, you know, going to be bigger than the uh, smartphone market. And the next year, of course, you know, come to smart TV, right? So every TV is, you know, connected to the internet. And then everybody, you know, can play, you know, through the internet or, you know, free to play, right? So since uh, PlayStation 4 is, you know, selling very well, yep. but only, you know, 6 million or 7 million, right, sales. But if, you know, smart TV, Every you know how you know TV become you know smart TV, then the chance is huge, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, trend is uh, of course you know mobile game is more mid core core like this, and then also you know tablet is you know upcoming, and then next is you know smart TV, and then of course you know Oculus, right? Oculus. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, so that's you know next you know step. Yeah, I do I I do agree. The VR thing might will if they can actually make make the mass make it very mass, it could be a Big trending thing in the future, but that's right. more a prediction. So, of course, Stefan, how about your side? Like, I do understand that some companies like Line, they all at, they have been actually getting games onto their own platform. Yeah. From your side, do you think that's also a big trend that's just going to continue on and on? I mean, or are there others? Um, Line, Kakao Talk, WeChat, you know, integrated games you know, into their overall messaging platform. Uh, I think that'll continue to happen. Um, but from Facebook's perspective, um, we see the most interesting trend. This is based on user data, right? This is based on gamers, not publishers or developers, is, is really the story I was mentioning earlier around cross-platform. So getting people to have the same gaming experience wherever they are throughout the day. So again, commuting to work, in between meetings at the office, at home watching TV, um, porting your game through multiple devices. We've seen a lot more engagement, better monetization, um, overall much better experience, total payment volume goes up. So. That's a trend where um, I think is still pretty nascent, right? We're we're starting to work with clients right now. We, we've got several hundred publishers and developers that we're working with in, in Asia, uh, a few hundred in Southeast Asia. Um, and that's a trend that, that we're actually trying to drive um, based on data that we're getting back from uh, users and games. All right, awesome. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Hugo? Any trends you spot apart from the ones they've mentioned? Sure, well, I, I will bounce on that last point. Um, sure. It, you don't have to to think that the game experience cross platform is the same it could be uh, complementary so for example when we when we developed uh, with the watchdogs uh, the ctos app, app right the ctos yeah. app you're not trying to to play uh, as aiden in the city however you are the surveillance cameras and you have a top view on the on the city and, and it's very complementary it makes sense it's connected and i think that's what people love um, so the first point is don't try to think cross-platform with the way that it has to be the same game. It could be a different game, but the same brand and the same environment and, and a similar engagement. 
Uh, the second thing that I see as a trend is quality. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of games out there. Uh, we talked about the cost of in investment just for acquisition in marketing and also in development. Um, we are uh, in, in a good position at Ubisoft because we have brands, strong brands, so that helps. Um, but we have to think that uh, people are more and more demanding and they want very high quality games. So the biggest effort that we are uh, leaning towards is how do we create great experiences, uh, great storytelling, uh, and, and really not consider, I, I think free to play as a, as a cheap and, and not very good game is over. That's the past. Yeah, it is. The, the new free to play, the new mobile games are very high quality. And you have to think big and be ambitious in terms of uh, experience. Totally agree on that. All right, so Revive, uh, anything to add from there? Or have you got yeah, actually trend? I pretty much agree with or what what they said, especially these days with the mobile uh, handset, right? It's becoming very powerful with a powerful chip. It has a graphic engine, all those, and actually there's a very good uh, engine like a Unity 3D. I think mobile game, smartphone game, is becoming quite engaging. I think it's not just a smartphone. In fact, uh, there's a lot of Facebook game that's highly engaging also with the 3D. Uh, a game all those thing. So uh, there might be a blurring between like, in terms of quality between like a mobile uh, console and, and PC in the in the near future. And also this would be good basically to have like a, a cross platform. Uh, cross platform actually is where, uh, is what the gamers want. Basically I want to play my game on my smartphone. One is it's done, I go to office or I go to home, can open up, play continue to play on the Facebook and other platform. I think that's what the, as a user what what uh, we want to, to have that basically. And I hope that the cross-platform game acceleration can go faster than what actually it is now. Yeah. Okay. So pro tip: Yeah, don't make a cat. Don't 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 make a flappy bird clone. That's all. all right. So all right, let's go to the, the whole pigeonhole questions things that you see at the board there. So let's pick the first one right here. How? Oh wait, give me a sec. Okay, I'm not sure how this works. <laughs> just give me a second. All right. Well, I'll just ask it from here. No worries. All right. So. Someone, uh, Benjamin Forshad asks, how would you implement gaming elements into applications to drive consumers and customers to enter content and data? This is open, by the way, so first guy to come up and answer, just answer it from your side. Do you want me to repeat the question? Well, is, is I this think this is a question related to gamification, perhaps, uh, yeah, into yeah. the application. Ah, there we go. Is, is this application application or game application? Oh, the question isn't that specific. Um, <laughs> do you want to switch to another question? You guys feel a bit confused or? Skip. Okay, skip. skip. All right. <laughs> You're not sure about gamification. <laughs> we will go to, um, let's see. Uh, ah, here's a good one. Um, how do you influence traditional non-gamers to engage in mobile slash online gaming to expand your customer base? Um, I think it's I, well. I can use an example, it's, but this is not really just like non-gamers. I'm talking about from casual into the uh, for, to the hardcore. Uh, I see that the trend like uh, Blazer actually launched a Hearthstone, which is a card battle game, and they use the World of Warcraft uh, character. So I met up with a lot of my friends who actually start playing the uh, Hearthstone because it's free to play, and then they become interesting with uh, interested with the character, and then they start asking me about the World of Warcraft game. And because World of Warcraft now is like a, a free to play until uh, level 20, so some of them actually they do download. So, yeah, I think if you have like a hardcore game, you can make it the casual version of it. I think it can help to drive uh, uh, the, the casual user or non user into, into, into first engage your casual, into the, your casual game after they even go into the hardcore game. Yeah, so this one I have an opinion. Like, you know, in Japan, there is, you know, lying with, you know, casual game, right? And then also, you know, Kakao with casual game. And then even China market last year, you know, growing. That's because of, you know, WeChat plus, you know, casual game, right? So that kind of the casual game is, you know, easy. So even the non-gamer, they can, you know, play the game and, you know, make it fun, right? So that's very important. So my suggestion is Facebook, both WhatsApp. Okay. WhatsApp should open the platform to us. Mm -hmm. We can make a game. I can give you Mark Zuckerberg's email address. You know, <laughs> All right, you can, awesome. You can, you can email him directly. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, abs that's absolutely a trend. I mean, I think the, the broader question here, the broader point is um, the gamer profile has expanded. Right? It's gotten bigger. There's more segmentation happening, uh, cohorts, like 
or new cohorts are being created every single day. So because of that, uh, how are we uh, marketing different games to different users? Um, again, from a Facebook perspective, um, we have data on our users. So we can look at psychographic data, demographic data. We can say, oh, wow, this person playing um, Candy Crush is interested also in sports. So are they, are they also playing a sports game? So I think it's really based on looking at the data, looking at different people's profiles, segmenting them, and then matching them with the right game genre. All right. I believe Anton, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just, just really quickly. I mean, for what I do is I think we learn from, from, our, from data. We have, we have to learn from data uh, that's... One out. Like big data, right, more or less? Yes, or? Uh, but what I, I do actually for this, uh, I have a really ridiculous answer, is that my mom is my test, test data for non-gamers, mm -hmm. because my mom hates games, and I, she thinks it's a waste of time, and will make your grid go bad, and make your eyes go blind, or something like that. But So if, if I can have a prototype, and I can get my mom to be interested, I think it will, you know, it will be a hit, something like that. Right. Uh, Hugo, maybe something more to add before we end this entire fireside chat. Um, I, I agree with a lot of uh, aspects. Uh, simplifying so that we, we have the grandma test in, uh, you know, sometimes when we do play tests, which is if if uh, a grandma or a complete casual noob doesn't understand the first steps, that means your onboarding, hand-holding experience is, is probably not good. Um, Ubisoft has a, a school for design, and um, people, the game designers go to, to Paris or to Montreal, and they study what we call rational game design. And rational game design is a scientific approach to introduce uh, difficulty layers, ingredients, um, and, um, and, and to complexify the experience step by step. Right, right. And awesome. so the, that onboarding phase is very critical. Uh, we use Watchdog's a good example. It uses the mobile app uh, that non-gamers can use uh, in order to potentially like the game and then buy the PS4 game. And I think at E3 yesterday, there were a few announcements, uh, in particular one for Far Cry 4, mm -hmm. where, we, and, and Sony, I believe, is pushing this, is how do you allow to try the game so that I can go into your session, you own the game, I don't, but you can invite me, and then we can play together, and or I can just watch and just be there as an observer and maybe engage in a certain way, and then at one point, I can decide to participate and jump in and maybe buy and, and download a section of the game or buy a level or something like this. All right, I think that's something mobile can actually explore on in the future. I believe time is up because the machine right in front of us is flashing and stuff. And there's so many questions, but of course, too little time. But if any of you want to actually have a chat with these fine gentlemen here, you can always come up after the presentation and whatnot, exchange business cards, the usual big deal. So thanks again, and give a big hand to everyone here. Thank you.